the next few days. Also, I would like to thank them for putting up this very, very exciting program, which is very long, unfortunately. I won't be able to stay until the end. So I'm going to um, give our lectures on weak measurements. So even though weak measurements have been around for maybe 25 years, uh, they're still not, at, let's say, a general agreement on exactly what um, content is, what the meaning is. You won't find any review on weak measurements, any I mean, general review that somehow um, would give you the, the, the complete picture. So that's um, a bad thing and also a good thing, since then I can choose the content I will, I will put inside. So I will uh, give you essentially lectures with almost no technicalities, because the idea is to think about what the wave function is, uh, what, what it is relative to uh, the physical reality, and that's the whole idea uh, that lies be beyond, uh, that, that lies within weak measurements. It's to try to see if we can explain some of the properties of, of quantum systems. Um, so, uh, before giving you the outline, I'll uh, come back to my abstract. So, so the main question we'll be interested in is what is the value of a given physical property of a quantum system at some intermediate time between the system preparation and uh, its final detection? So the idea is we prepare the system in an initial state. So this we know how to do. Then um, the system evolves. So we know there's a deterministic equation, Schrodinger's equation, that gives you the evolution. And then at the end, we make a measurement of some observable because we want to know something about the property. And we get a final state. So this one, we choose it, of course. Uh, it's a random outcome. And so the question is, can I say something about the value of a property in the, at some intermediate time? So, uh, if you remember your basics of quantum mechanics in principle, well, uh, standard quantum mechanics tells you you can't do this, and the question is meaningless. And this is, um, this is due to the special uh, status of measurements in quantum mechanics. And I will talk uh, about this in a minute. And so, uh, standard answer, well, what you would do is just get counterfactual paradoxes. To, to say anything about the value of this property represented by A at some intermediate time. Now, the, the whole idea behind weak measurements is that standard quantum mechanics gives you, um, gives you another answer, and the answer is uh, a sort of minimally perturbing, non-destructive uh, measurement. And this is what weak measurements are. And of course, the reason why in the last uh, 10 years or so weak measurements have become more popular is that this protocol that I will describe uh, is experimentally feasible. And so uh, people have made a lot of experiments. And this is part of the, of the success in, of why uh, weak measurements have attracted, are attracting a lot of attention, even though they're very controversial. So all this raises fundamental questions. So uh, I think this first week and maybe next week also we'll hear a lot about um, measurements because this is really the, the, the central, central question. Then there's also um, when we will try to, to, to understand the meaning of weak measurements, there's the question of um, how properties are ascribed uh, in quantum physics. And what is a property? When can you say that a system has this or that property? So this is also uh, something that we have to discuss. So this is a conceptual issue, right? It's, uh, um, and of course, the we know the physics are described by state vectors, and so we want to know the relationship between state vectors, properties, and measurements, and this is what uh, lies behind. So as I said, there's no real review. There's no genuine global review that would allow you to um, get an idea, and so I haven't built a review, I just selected things that I found uh, interesting to, to talk about. So, of course, if you have questions, you can interrupt me. If I uh, 
going to go too fast because I have slides, so maybe I will, uh, won't have time to cut through the diagrams or you're not interested in the diagrams or it's too slow. Just, just you know, yell and, and add and interrupt. So the outline, first, um, I will talk about properties and measurements. So this will be some sort of almost philosophical introduction. Then we'll have a closer look uh, at uh, measurements in quantum mechanics. And then we'll also have to talk a little bit about measurements in classical mechanics. Because there are many uh, features which are really quantum, but some features are also some features that are sometimes taken to be quantum that also exist in classical. Then I will really introduce the weak measurement protocol, and then um, we'll talk about weak values, which is what you measure in a weak measurement, and see a couple of examples. So uh, if I want to detail the outline, so first um, I will talk about state vectors in physical reality. So this is um, just like asking some questions. I will not answer uh, also by telling you how to answer. Uh, relationship between state vectors and physical reality is not uh, I'm really, really happy that uh, this is one of the problems that have been uh, hanging on since the, the, the inception of quantum mechanics. Then um, we'll talk a little bit about observables and eigenstates. This is, this is usually how we uh, think that um, properties are ascribed in quantum systems. You can do measurements, uh, measure uh, something proportional to an eigenvalue, and the system is an eigenstate. This is <coughs> and then um, we talk, I'll, I'll talk to you about the delay choice uh, experiment and the three box paradox. So many of you are maybe familiar with that. Uh, so we'll see if it's uh, worth spending time on this. And so uh, when we'll jump to measurements in quantum and classical mechanics, well, I'll briefly recall the postulates. Um, the idea is that the postulates are not enough, and so this is why von Neumann made his famous model in which he explicitly introduced the Fuiter. And I will close talking about non-ideal measurements, so this will be very qualitative. So when I will introduce the weak measurement protocol, I will talk first about strong measurements at intermediate time, so you can always do a projective measurement, and, and you can start from some initial to some final point, but you can always make a projective measurement and then do another evolution to reach the final point. Before getting on uh, weak measurements, weak values, so we were asked to include tutorials, so rather than doing the tutorial at the end, I will, uh, I will try to compute some weak values just to kind of play with, with the, the formula. There are very few formulas actually in this. And, um, then we'll try to apply this weak measurement idea to um, try to understand their properties. Uh, and we'll talk about what can we say about the past of the quantum, quantum particles that are detected in some final state. And in particular, we can um, try to understand what does this disembodiment uh, imply. So this is something we can discuss. And then I will talk about trajectories in quantum systems because you can. Uh, although in principle you cannot define trajectories in quantum, quantum mechanics, so there, are, there are several ways to introduce trajectories in quantum uh, systems, and so I will mention two of them and see how weak measurements can uh, allow to measure, in some sense, uh, these trajectories. Okay, so, uh, so the, the, from a very uh, general backdrop. Um, We can, we can say that the issue, if we want to understand what lies beyond all these uh, state vectors, our property ascribed, and, and so on, is to uh, answer the following question, why is science so successful? So from a pragmatic point of view, you can just say, well, uh, we have filtered the bad theories, those that did not work. And so basically, theories are just a bunch of recipes, and uh, we just learn how to craft better recipes, and we throw away the bad ones. This is a very pragmatic approach, and um, basically, the symbols we manipulate, they're not related to reality, or at least the question is not very uh, relevant. And now there's the other view, which uh, is usually called scientific realism, is to say that, well, in our theories, there are terms, theoretical terms, uh, 
that refer to aspects of the physical world. And there's a famous uh, argument by Henry Woodham, who was a professor of science, passed away last year, uh, who says that, well, if um, the terms we have in our theories do not refer uh, to things existing out there, then uh, only a miracle could account for the success of science. It's impossible to... Uh, possible to have all this predictive uh, success if our, our, our um, theories just are a bunch of recipes. Then. That's what the argument says. So, uh, from a pragmatic point, instrumentalist point of view, in some sense, there is no fundamental distinction between science and witchcraft. Uh, science is a, just as successful, sophisticated form of witchcraft. So there's a very nice quotation by, uh, by Nash, a mathematician. All that says, that's what kind of, uh, I don't think I have it here. I'll bring it subsequently. Now, from the realist point of view, um, well, of course, terms refer to aspects of reality. That doesn't mean there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But we have some sort of representation that we kind of refine each way we build a new theory. Yes, a weak, weak volume. I'll just <laughs> Good. Now it's better. And I'll try not to, not to shake my hand. <laughs> I'll be very static then. Um, so th there's always the issue of how um, when we change from one theory to another, we can still say that the terms refer to aspects of reality, of the physical reality. And so there, there are many arguments that have been given, so I don't really think I will spend, um, I will spend time, but you, you all know the limiting cases, and uh, like, for example, between relativistic and Newtonian, and, and, um, and that's something that we cannot do in quantum mechanics. We don't know how to recover classical physics from uh, quantum subjects. So I think there's a microphone. So I can give you an I can give you an example. Um, classical mechanics. So you have a, a basic ontology. So you have material points, and you're looking at the motion of material points. So your basic ontology is made of material points. That does not mean that you have that the world is made of material points, but that's an idealization that sticks a good representation of physical reality. And so uh, you look at the, di the dynamics. Right? Look at the dynamics of these material points, and uh, that. I'm sorry. And and so those are the referring terms. The material points are the referring terms of your theory. Now you also have another uh, form of uh, classical mechanics that you know, which uh, is based on the Hamilton-Jacobi framework and on the um, canonical transformations. Uh, here you see the help. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, so you have uh, one ref one framework in which you have referring terms, which are supposed to refer to aspects of reality, and another framework, which is also classical mechanics, in which you have non-referring terms. I mean, nobody uh, will pretend or claim that uh, the classical action exists out there in the in the physical world. It's just supposed to be an epistemic knowledge-related term. And here instead, we have, we, we have referring terms that are supposed to refer to an ideal, in, a, in an idealized way to aspects of reality. So, of course, the problem with quantum mechanics is um, that we don't know if uh, the, the, there are referring terms. Uh, the received view is that it, there are no referring terms, that all the um, theoretical terms we manipulate are knowledge related, but we don't know to what they are related in, in, in physical reality. And this is, uh, of course, a problem because uh, 
even though we try to accumulate uh, observations and try to ascribe reference to the theoretical terms, there is no agreement because there's absolutely no way, uh, an ambiguous way, to ascribe terms, to ascribe reference to theoretical terms of quantum theory. So um, we can always assume there's a, you know, you assume there's some basic ontology, underlying ontology, but then if it's just uh, totally arbitrary, um, you can always, if, if you add ad hoc hypothesis, you can always, in some sense, save this ontology, and so you will have competing interpretations with each one endowed with a specific ontology that will tell you what uh, the, the, the underlying uh, physical reality to, to quantum uh, formalism is. And that leads us to the, um, yes. So the, the yeah, so the, the idea of scientific realism is that um, I mean, you cannot choose the ontology. You can propose some ontology, then you will um, make a lot of observations, logical connections, to think with sufficient good arguments that the ontology corresponds to, the, the proposed ontology corresponds to the physical reality, to some extent. Uh, if, if a Bohmian comes and tells you, yes, uh, the world is made of uh, point-like particles and waves, and somebody else comes and tells you, no, the, 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 the real universe is just uh, bifurcating uh, wave functions and so on, there is, there is absolutely no way to discriminate, and there is no way to as ascribe reference to these different positions, to these different um, uh, ideas that are given to, to the theoretical terms. And so basically, uh, my opinion is that th this undermines the enterprise scientific reality. So it's totally arbitrary. So it's good to have candidate ontologies, but then uh, as long as you cannot accumulate sufficient evidence that could lead you to specific predictions made by the theory. You cannot observe the, the proposed ontology. Uh, and that, as long as you can't do this, then it's, um, in my view, it, it, it's not uh, convincing. So if we, for example, if we had some observational awareness concerning the state vector, somebody said the state vector corresponds to this thing, and then somebody observed that specific uh, specific claim, let's say, that could be observed, then yes, then we would say, yeah, the state vector is real, corresponds to, I don't know, this type of field and so on. So this is something, of course, that we, we know we can't prove something. Then there are all, all these ideas that there's maybe something underlying, uh, uh, the quantum formalism would, would emerge from some underlying uh, ontology. So, so those are questions that we, we don't know uh, how to solve. So I just... Um, Use this quotation by Pauli because uh, at the beginning he was very, uh, very much, he had a very much pragmatic attitude, and towards the end of his life he really uh, thought it was important to, to try to uh, uh, come up with an image of reality uh, that would um, be consistent and with, with the quantum formalism. Okay, so, so basically, if I answer also, well, this question, we can also say that if each one comes with his own candidate ontology but cannot go further in, in trying to assess that this ontology is a correct answer, then we have a supermarket ontology, and then it's just a question of choosing one's favorite interpretation. So, of course, it's, again, it's interesting to have candidate ontologies because you can discover new effects, you can um, try to make new predictions, but uh, you also have to be... Um, most people are. I mean, not, not many people believe that their uh, proposed ontology is the correct one, and all the others are wrong. But uh, it's more like a supermarket in which, according to your taste or your, your field of where you were trained, you will choose uh, whether there, there is an intrinsic, intrinsic quantum classical cut, whether um, uh, phase localization achieves classicality or not, uh, whether it's spontaneous localization which will give you the correct answer. Uh, maybe in many worlds is uh, the only way to take uh, the quantum formalism seriously. I mean, at face value, that's just the only Schrodinger equation. And of course, the Boy, the boy -Bohm, Bohm model. Um, 
you you add yes you 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 add as a, a nonlinear term so it, it can become different but for the moment it's so so if at some point uh, the prediction uh, kind of the, the nonlinear parameters lead to new predictions then it will be uh, extremely interesting but for For the moment, you're just setting bounds on the value of the parameters, and, and uh, that's very interesting, of course. But we need warrants at some point, right? We need observational warrants, and so that, this is why it's a, a very interesting approach, which will, again, not, I mean, not answer all the questions and what happens in between you know, this very small instant in which the dynamical uh, reduction takes place. So, but, but at least that would open an important and interesting uh, venue of uh, investigation. So, oh, um, the question can be framed in this sense. Is the state vector more than a bookkeeping device? Um, so, I, one of the ideas that I will try to convey is that weak measurements opens, can or open new observational windows because they're non-destructive and minimally disturbing. And so they may provide arguments um, pointing to the fact that uh, maybe, again, I'm very, I'm very cautious here, uh, some of the features described by the quantum state, by the state vectors, have uh, uh, um, are features of, of physical reality. So I'll, I'll try to, 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 to do this. Um, so, so we cannot say much about the state vectors, but of course what we can do is make experiments we can control and manipulate uh, the, the systems we, we, we isolate. And um, as you know, when we make measurements, basically we are measuring a property, which is represented by an observable, which is an operator in Hilbert space, so it's mathematic. And uh, we go, so from the system to the formalism, which tells us that we will find the property in an eigenvalue corresponding to an eigenvector of the operator representing the observable, which in turn stands for a physical property. So I mean, what I mean by these loops is that the um, connection between your system and, and the measurement outcome is very is not direct at all. It's, it's uh, you're really doing something uh, to the system. You're really modifying your system to obtain uh, a result. So we will have a closer look at this um, a little bit later on, spe specifically in the context of von Neumann's model. So I can just uh, point out that there will be non-classical correlations uh, that will appear, and non-classical, non-classical, but I mean, I mean by non-classical features that are not that do not exist in, in classical mechanics. So we have correlations and projections, and, and so this is those will be features of, of the measurement uh, process that do not, do not exist in, in, in classical. So. Um, most people know at least the beginning of uh, Paris' uh, famous sentence, quantum phenomena do not occur in a Hilbert space, they occur in a laboratory. This is true, but then, as, as he says, uh, we have to make the connection. We need to make the connection between our theoretical description and what we do in a laboratory. So he calls this a translation, so he was more uh, instrumentalist than scientific realist, but uh, Even if, if we, I mean, if we want to, to try to find some reference to, to the theoretical terms of uh, well, what the state vector represents, we also need to do this operation. Okay, so now uh, we're trying to get a little bit more uh, to the questions we, we are interested in. 
Um, so what are the properties of a quantum system as it evolves before I make this final measurement? So I think most of you have heard about the delayed choice experiment, which was suggested by Wheeler late 1970s and early 1980s. So you have an interferometer in two configurations. So this is configuration one. So here you have the particle bottom which enters the interferometer. And then you have the two output ports, D1 or D2. And so the question is which path took a particle detected at D1 or D2? So we're not making actual measurements, we just detect something at D1, we want to know the path. So the idea, what Peter said, is that once we know the outcome, we can infer the past, because if we detect uh, the particle here, then we know it came from the path, the lower path of R. Now, uh, Wheeler said what happens so if we add a beam splitter, then uh, we don't have this particle aspect, we have of course, the wave aspect, the wave that travels through both paths. So here I didn't mention, but you have a phase shifter, so you can adjust. And um, then what he, the, the, the paradox is that the wave of particle aspects of the detected events depends on the presence or not presence of the second beam splitter. So of course you can, what, what it's called delayed choice, you can choose to add the second beam splitter after the particle has entered into a parameter, so just before actually it arrives here. And so, if you delay the insertion of the second beam splitter, uh, Wheeler said, well, the particle or wave aspect will depend on our choice just before detection. And so the conclusion is that, um, well, in, in, in a loose way of speaking, we decide what the photon shall have done after it has already done. Of course, in actuality, it is wrong to talk of the root of a photon. For a proper way of speaking, we recall once more that it makes no sense to talk of the phenomenon until it has been brought to a close by an irreversible act of amplification. So it's a famous sentence, no elementary phenomenon is a phenomenon until it is a registered, observed phenomenon. So again, the idea is that we should not try to uh, understand what happens in between because otherwise we will, uh, we will be led to time. Actually, of course, uh, Bohr already uh, had told us, warned us, that um, it makes no sense uh, to infer the path and because it's not measured. And if we want to make measurements, we are uh, changing the, the setup. We are introducing a, a new setup and we're doing something else in the system. And, and so we have to be uh, careful when we try to infer uh, what happened to the past of a particle once it has been detected to reconstruct the past is simply not possible, or at least it leads to paradox. So another paradox, maybe, I don't know if some people know it, it's the three box paradox, as suggested by Aronoff and Weidmann. So now we have three boxes. Box A, B, and C. And so when the particles in the upper box, box A, I uh, use a state vector A to describe what the particle is here. And the particles in the second box, I describe, I use the uh, vector D and so on for particles. So this is uh, A being the particles in box A. Of course, a general quantum state, you can just superpose A, B, and C in this way. If we want to know where a particle is, we just have to open the boxes. So this uh, is represented by projectors in Hilbert space. So for example, if we want to know if a particle is in box B, we have uh, this projector, pi B. As you know, projectors have two eigenvalues, one and zero. If it's one, I found the box in box B. So this is the eigenvector, so it's what's in box B. If uh, we have the eigenvalue zero, then of course it means 
the particle was not bus B, and so the eigenvector is an orthogonal subspace to B. So A is denoted by A. So the question now is where can we find the particle between Ti and Tf? So I prepare the system at initial time in some state. So let's choose this is the initial state, the superposition which you can read here. Then at the end I make some projected measurements. So there is some observable which I did not write, but this is one of the eigenstates of that observable. So of course, when I will make uh, the measurement, I can find the system in three different states, but I will only keep uh, the states corresponding to this, uh, to this eigenvector. So this is called post-selection. And the preparation is sometimes called pre-selection. We will see these terms appear frequently. Just waiting because some of you write things down, but if you want me to go faster, I can speed up. I don't know. Yes. So you make you make a projective measurement. So you, you what we did here, you find it's it's can be here, uh, so you make a projective measurement, you get one in, or zero, so if you want to uh, look if the particle is in box A, you make a projective measurement on this state, and if, if so, so the first question is, how can I know wh when, it, when the particle is in this state, right? So, so, so then you make a projective measurement. If you, do this, if you open box A, it will tell you one, it's there, or zero, it's not there. So that's the only thing you can know. That's the first part. So the second question is, uh, well, second question, you just, you, you will see what happens. Okay. So, but, but making a projective measurement on a state without uh, post-selection is uh, straightforward, right? I mean, that's, uh, just find the, you open a box and you find the particle, you don't find it. Now here I'm trying to add this condition that I, I, I assume I let the system evolve. I will find it in this state, and where was the particle in between? So, if I want to know if the particle is in box A, what I would do, so I would use conditional, uh, well, I would use, I mean, the only thing I can do is open a box, and the only way to do this is to use a projector. So, if I want to open box A, uh, I know that I, will, I can, get two uh, eigenvalues, one, the box is in A, or zero, the box is in B plus C. Now, if you remember that I have my final state constraint, what you realize is that if I get an eigenvalue zero, then I'm in this subspace, but this subspace is orthogonal to my fi the final state that I'm supposed to obtain. So, the conclusion is that the particle must have been in box A because if I don't find the particle in box A, I can never reach the final state. I'm not convinced. So the, the statement is, um, I measure the, I open the box A. If it's not there, then I'm in this subspace. It's not, it's, the, the particle is not in box A, so it's, 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 it has to be in B or C, or in some superposition of B and C. But at any rate, because I obtained zero when I measured A, it has to be the subspace associated with the eigenvalue zero. Now, this subspace is orthogonal to the final state. What does it mean? It means that if you, make, if you take the scalar product of this subspace with the final state, you have zero, and what does that mean? That means that you cannot reach the final state. If you're in this subspace, you can never obtain the final state. Okay? So if you assume uh, that you 
reach the final state, you cannot obtain zero. You have to find the particle in box A. Otherwise, you will not reach the final state. No, I suppose there is, uh, yeah, I suppose there is no, no stuff on Newtonian and there's nothing. You can, uh, if you want a physical rendering of this system, you can assume there is one. But I will give you a, a bit later on a physical rendering of the system with some resolution and wave packets and, and that helps. I'm, I'm not, okay, so, so now I, I will do the same thing with box B. So I open box B and I can find one. The particle is in box B or zero, the particle is not in box B. And again, I have the same argument. If the particle is not in box B, then I'm in this subspace, A plus C, and this subspace is orthogonal to my final state. So if I find zero, if I don't find the particle in box B, then I can never reach my final state. So there's an observable, and I measure this observable, it has three eigenstates, and I only, I, I filter, so I mean, I, I, each time, I only filter when I, I get this, uh, this state. If, if I don't get this state when I measure the final observable, I throw away, and it doesn't count in my physical. So of course, this is. Why have you chosen the final state so that it should not be in one of the boxes? Yeah, that, box. well. The, well, because actually the, the way that, the, that they chose the final state uh, to be like this is that it forces you, if you suppose you open a box, it forces you to find always the particle in box A if you open box A, and always find the particle in box B if you open box B. And that is the paradox, of course, because you only have one particle. If you open box A and you're sure to find it, and you open box B and you're sure to find it, I mean, there's a problem. Right? So again, we, yes. So let me hear the, the, the So, the pre, so choosing the pre-selection state is always, you prepare the state, so that's no, pro, that's, uh, no problem. But choosing the, the post-selection, it's just filtering. So if you want to read. Yes. No. No, filtering is, uh, no, no, filtering is not, filtering is a projective, filtering comes for a projective measurement. So this will become clear because I will introduce a unitary. No. No, no. Post selection is a, is a filter, so you stop everything you don't like. It's highly not unitary. Yes, actually, it's, it, in this case, it's just a statistical filtering. I mean, you will get, uh, well, if you have. So in principle, if you measure this operator, let's call it B, it has three eigenstates, psi1, psi2, and psi f. Uh, it's not a, say, O. And then you can obtain one of the three, and you only choose this one. And so this is equivalent to like, like throwing away, because you can, if you choose, if you get this one or this one, you throw it away. So if you can represent this by, if you want, a non-unitary that would Kill, suppress psi one and psi two, but this is just psi f is just a normal uh, projective measurement. Yeah, so psi f arises from a normal projective measurement. It's just called post selection because you filter, you throw away when you don't get psi f. Yes. 
for that sub ensemble. And if I open box B, right. right. And, and if I choose another state, then this will not be true. Right? One of the other, psi one of psi two, then this will not hold because I need, I need this property, I need the orthogon orthogonality property here to hold. What happens, and this is something we will see in the sequel, what happens at some intermediate time, it depends on the final state you are in. Okay, so, um, so it's okay with the paradox? Yes, counterfactual, yes. So we're trying to understand what happens if I could look. So we know that if we really look, then we're going to make it, I mean, at least a, 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 the standard um, a formula doesn't tell us that if you want to look, we have to make a projective measurement. If you make a projective measurement, we will kill the, the evolution, and so we will not reach psi f at any rate. So it's meaningless, that's Bohr's point of view. Now, uh, Bohr also said that if we try to uh, do as if, so it's called counterfactual, you, 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 you reach paradoxes. So this is what we obtain here. We find the paradox is that the box uh, A, I mean, if I, uh, the particle is surely in box A and is surely also in box B at the same time. So it's, that's, that, that's meaningless, that's nonsense. No, that, that's just due to the fact that um, uh, the, the, the way, actually it's Born's rule, is, is that the uh, probability to obtain a final state is given by Born's rule, and so you just choose your states in a clever way so that this probability is zero. This is how, how the thing is constructed. You want the transi transition amplitude is zero between your intermediate time and, and, and the final state. But we'll, we will see this in, in more detail. Uh, so so as, as one of you point, pointed out, so the paradox is due to the fact that we are using counterfactual reasoning. Because if we modify, that's what I just said, if we modify the experiment, then post-selection may not happen. We will not get the final state. And so we can uh, go to sleep uh, without nightmares, we will not have this type of paradox. So actually, we will see that with weak measurements, you kind of are, are allowed to do all this without, uh, without doing projective measurements of some intermediate time. And so in some sense, the paradox is bad. So before uh, getting to weak measurements, I will introduce, uh, I will talk about measurements really normal measurements just to as a refresher or, or maybe for a, you know. There have been, yes, a few experiments. I think uh, Urbashi here has made one of the experiments. So, so the, 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 the paradox is relies on counterfactuality, and then when you do weak measurements, you obtain something that can be interpreted as a paradox or not. It just depends on the interpretation you have of weak measurements. A little bit, so we'll get to that a little bit later. So when, when you're given, uh, when you learn quantum mechanics, you're given postulates, usually representation of physical states, so you tell you, okay, vectors in Hilbert space, blah, 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 blah. 
uh, the time evolution of state vectors, so that's Schrodinger equations in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And then uh, you're giving some uh, weird postulates on quantum measurements, so each dynamical variable is represented by a Hermitian operator. The eigenvalues of that operators are the possible values that the dynamical variable can take. You have Born's so the, the order of presentation is uh, the equivalent. You don't always find these postulates, but there, sometimes there are others that can be derived from the, these ones or vice versa. Um, so you have Born's rule, and then the fact that there's uh, rejection, state reduction collapse, I don't know how you want to call this. Those are things you know. So if we want to do a simple application to a spin one half or a qubit, then as you know, you have some initial state. Uh, so let's say that uh, my operator is the sigma Z the spin component on the Z axis, K was plus minus one. So what's usually sometimes, usually let's say, it's called pre-measurement state. It's the action of the operator on the initial state. So this doesn't mean anything, but uh, it's always often presented like this. I mean, it means something from a mathematical point of view. I don't, mean, I don't know if it makes sense from a physical point of view, but okay, we can mathematically just uh, let sigma Z act on psi. And then at the end, we have the projection. So it's plus or minus with the probabilities. So this is something you know. So we can do the same thing uh, just with the projector. So this is something you just did. So if you just project this entire minus, minus, then you will get plus one equal the minus state. And uh, you will always have the uh, minus component So oh, um, these postulates actually, the, 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 so they work, of course, but we need a more, uh, we need a more physical model. So for example, if we go back to Wheeler's uh, side up, let's say, so I can say Alexander, then if you make a projective measurement here, and you get a null result, then you know that the, your um, wave Delta particle that travels through uh, path one, although uh, the particle or the wave on path one never interacted with uh, your apparatus in path two. So basically, if you introduce, and that's what led von Neumann to introduce his model, if you, if you introduce his model, you can under try to understand what's happening. If you just rely on the postulate, uh, then it's kind of mysterious what you're, what you're achieving in this case. So what von Neumann did was to add a pointer and uh, then, of course, if you do classical measurements, in principle, you also need to include explicitly the pointer. And we will briefly look at classical pointers first, and then uh, at what quantum pointers have uh, in particular. So let's assume we have a system Hamiltonian H0. So that's the system you're interested in. You have a pointer, so the pointer is a particle with a free Hamiltonian. And then you have a coupling term, so that's the H interaction. So what this H interaction does, it couples some region of space, so this is what is not explicitly written here, but it couples the variable A, which is a space uh, variable belonging to the system, so P and P here are the uh, space state variables of the, of the system. P is a dynamical variable of the pointer, and, there, and then you have the coupling uh, with uh, the coupling strength. So it's basically non-zero, so typically uh, G would be something like this. It would be non-zero during the time of the coupling, uh, during the time of the measurement. And when you integrate over uh, the time the measurement takes, you get some sort of effective coupling constant. And so the total Hamiltonian is given now by uh, system Hamiltonian, pointer Hamiltonian, and interaction Hamiltonian.
So if uh, re you remember this definition of the Poisson bracket, uh, just a convenient way of writing Hamilton's equations in classical mechanics. So we, ha we have the equations of motion for um, the pointer. Here, so it's simply the Poisson bracket. So if you want the, the time evolution of your momentum is the Poisson bracket of Q and H, of the position, the Poisson bracket of Q and H. And so you can compute this. So basically, yes, yeah, so this sum over I here actually includes all, all the phase space variables, not only the system, but all the, all the phase space variables. So for the pointer, if we solve this, um, we find that P is a constant, and that Q for a time larger than after the measurement interaction has taken place. So the pointer position, Q is the pointer position, is its initial position plus uh, this free motion, additional term, it's just free motion, so you can always choose to be zero if you don't want free motion. Plus this term that is proportional to the value of the variable we want to measure, so the value uh, of A at time T0. So basically, this is what you expect, a, you expect a pointer to do. The final position relates uh, once you, of course, it's just calibrated to some initial position that you know, then just the final position gives you the value of the dynamic variable you're interested in, and so everything is of course, you have to assume something about the fact that the variable you're measuring does not evolve too much during the interaction time. Otherwise, you have to take some average. But okay, this is a minor, minor issue. Now, for a system variable, another one, well, for any system variable, F, you look at its evolution, it's given by these uh, Poisson brackets. So it's, of course, uh, these, it's a free evolution, so it's the one generated by the system Hamiltonian, plus this term that involves the Poisson bracket of uh, this observable and A. And so for F equals A, this Poisson bracket vanishes, and um, there's no back action, but for some other system observable, there will be uh, a disturbance generated by this measurement. So basically something that intuitively is pretty understandable is that if uh, you make a measurement, there will always be a disturbance in a classical system, even if you can try to make it as small as possible, there will always be a disturbance. With a pointer explicitly. Something? Well, in, so a pointer is something real, yes. So, as Popper said, you can kick it and it can kick you back, so that's one of his arguments. And um, the other argument is that in, in my uh, classical ontology, I can, uh, it, is, it, is, it is described, let's say, as a point-like uh, particle having a mass, a position, and a momentum. And so I'm happy with that. Yeah, your, your, needle, your needle is represented by, by this point like uh, UNP. You, know, you can take this to be the center of mass or the heat of needle or whatever. It depends on your model.
Yeah. So here I'm talking about classical systems. Yes, right? This is purely classical, but it's the, the, when you have two systems, one acts as a pointer because it's, the, the, it's basically you choose the one to be a pointer because it's the one, the needle you will read. So the needle, you can decide the needle is the system and then the, the A is the pointer, but it didn't make that. Yes, so I will, I will, we will choose, we, okay, we'll talk about this question next. Yes, this is classic, this is classical mechanics. Hamilton's equations of motion, it's, everything is classical. Yes, everything is classical, yes. I will just contrast the classical uh, description with the quantum description. Okay, you know, I'm just averaging, okay, because uh, if I want to solve Hamilton's equations exactly, then I cannot do it. I mean, I need to have a specific form of the Hamiltonian, so I'm just assuming that I'm integrating over time and averaging over the time of the interaction. This is just, uh, yeah, I should have, you're right, I should have said that. So I'm just, yeah, so, so I don't have a specific model. I cannot do anything explicitly because I don't have an explicit model, so I'm just assuming that I'm taking the um, Poisson bracket you see here and just taking some average over the time of the interaction and of course this will be at best an approximation. So the conclusion is that the value of a property can be inferred exactly by a meter uh, in classical mechanics, right? And that the system is always uh, disturbed by the back action uh, when measuring the value. And this is the... And, um, I assumed here that I, I had a well-defined uh, classical position, initial position, and, and of course I placed this variable, but in principle, of course, I don't know uh, the initial position nominally exactly, so I will have to introduce classical distributions for the classical system and initially classical distribution for the pointer. That can be solved using uh, Uville equation which are well known, and Uville was assumed to Poisson, so everything's fine. Uh, I won't do this because it's technically a little bit involved, but just uh, schematically, so for now a dichotomic classical uh, variable, which can take the values plus minus one, you initially have your pointer, which is now has a distribution in configuration space, so you know that you go from phase space to configuration space and integrate the Momentum, degrees of freedom. So that's before the interaction takes place. So this is your uh, system, has some initial distribution, the pointer, some initial distribution, and then they will interact. And after the measurement, then you basically will have uh, very schematically this type of uh, structure. You will have your uh, dichotomic variable, so you will have your system statistical statistical distribution corresponding to A equals plus one, correlated with the meter distribution, the needle going in that, especially in, in this way, let's say, and uh, the other one, the classical distribution of your system with for A equals minus one, correlated with uh, the distribution of the meter going the opposite way. So for an ideal measurement, um, what ideal means is that once the measurement is completed, then I will, of course, only have, uh, do the measurement, you always have one outcome, and I will say, I will do some Bayesian update. I didn't know, I ignored it. This, this thing is just a reflection of my ignorance. And once uh, I, I have uh, uh, an outcome, I know to which sub-ensemble it refers to, it belongs to. And so I will know if A equals plus one or minus one, and then I will know that I'm basically, if I obtain plus one, I'm in this situation in which my particle belongs to this statistical distribution and the meter to this one, or that situation. So this is something that is a uh, statistical, statistical distribution, so that's why you don't find it that. Now, quantum pointers. So, um, Okay. 
Yes, in principle, you can make it as small as possible. And it will never be zero. The thing is that you also have to control all the initial positions of your uh, pointer and your system, and this is something that can, in practice, never make it. You're, yeah, yeah, yes. No, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can make it a bit arbitrarily small. It, no, I mean, in that case, uh, it depends on the observable. I mean, if you're interested in an observable for which the Poisson bracket is not small, it cannot be small. It will depend on the observable you choose. Yes, but then if G is not, uh, this is something we will talk about just in a, in a moment. If G is not big enough, then I cannot make a measurement of M. There's a trade-off. It's okay about the quantum case, not the classical one. Well, we'll get to the quantum case. Uh, I mean, in von Neumann's model, you, you, you have a pretty well-defined limit. In the sense that it's basically an impulsive model. You want G to be small and uh, intense. The, the, I don't know, operationally, if you know what you're measuring, it's whether you obtain the eigenvalues or not. This would be the operational. So the Gaussian, uh, so th this is what we'll see. The Gaussian has, to, well, the, the interaction strength has, if you want to make a good measure, I mean, a measurement of the eigenvalues, of course, uh, the Gaussian has to be sufficiently uh, narrow or the interaction is sufficiently large for us to separate the different uh, pointer states because as well, this is the next slide, they, they, each pointer state is correlated to an eigenstate. So if if the Gaussians overlap or uh, uh, the interactions well, overlap because it's, they're too wide or the interaction strength is too small, then you would, you would lose this correlation between eigenstates and pointer states. And this comes out of, the, of a Neumann's model. So we now have a pointer and we choose, uh, let's say, a Gaussian state because it's supposed to be very much like a statistical distribution for the classical uh, state, for the classical point I just showed you. So it's basically localized in space. And so the initial quantum state is just initially you have in couple states with the system at time pi and uh, the pointer. So what we assume is that the system and the pointer will interact so during a brief time interval. So basically we'll want A to change too much during this time interval. And um, the time interval is tau, and it's centered around what I call T naught. So that's the time uh, during which the system and the quantum point interact. So we have exactly the same interaction Hamiltonian as in the classical case. Now it's well quantized. And again, we have the same type of uh, coupling profile, so I just should have put a capital G here instead of a small G. Complete? Yes. 
Yes, you can do the same for the machine learning. No. I mean, you're just coupling different. So, so uh, here, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you choose momentum, your Gaussian in position will shift in position. And if you, if you choose position, which happens like if you have a magnetic field that measures something, you will typically have position. And then you will have uh, a shift in momentum that will give you the split that, that I just wanted. So it uh, depends on the system you're considering. So the idea, uh, if you want to solve exactly, so now the total Hamiltonian is, is exactly as a classical one, but the Pontus version of it, of course. And if you want to solve Schrodinger's equation, so it depends on, of course, on the exact Hamiltonian. It's usually involved, but it's feasible for many systems. But typically what, well, this is what von Neumann did. You assume that um, the interaction Hamiltonian dominates during the time of the interaction. Um, either because the other Hamiltonians do not have, uh, do not evolve the system <clears throat> appreciably, or because G is very strong, so it dominates the Hamiltonian. And then you can solve, of course, uh, Schrodinger's equation. So basically, you're just interested in, in uh, your interaction Hamiltonian. When you integrate this uh, time Dependent coupling, you just get the effective overall coupling G. Now uh, we know what we can do. We introduce a basis of uh, the observable A. To the next slide. Yep. And so, um, once I do this, well, we have the following result. We see that each pointer state, so the psi k here is just the time the psi, uh, so first step. Maybe you don't remember. So, so w when uh, your momentum operator here, this generates, acts on your Gaussian, it generates a translation of, of your pointer in the position variable. So here is the translation. The translation is, of course, this term. And so each uh, eigenstate, AK, is correlated with a shifted uh, pointer position. And so von Neumann's model gives you a superposition, an entangled superposition, in which each uh, pointer state is correlated with an eigenstate of the property you're measuring. And of course, uh, the caveat is that, this is what you, you, the remark you made, is that um, you need to have orthogonality of these, uh, of these pointer states. Otherwise, the correlation is lost. So each of these pointer states will be shifted proportional to the eigenvalue. And the thing is, of course, that you have an entangled state, a superposition. And to obtain a single outcome, then you have this famous uh, random projection to some k naught that will appear. Uh, and this k naught will be correlated with the particular eigenstate and the particular eigenvalue that you will read on the pointer. That's part of the measurement problem, and I'm not going to talk about this. The, so so the, the important thing is, well, of course, that von Neumann's model uh, lets you recover the postulates, a physical model that, that allows you to understand uh, where the postulates come from. So the, the point is that this pre-measurement state, the pre-measurement that appears uh, Look at the postulate, it's a result of the interaction of your system with the pointer. So this is something that the Neumann's model uh, clearly points out. So, so the, the, the measurement state is just due to the fact that you have this coupling uh, 
Jesus so So you have entanglement and you have projection. Those are things. Uh, I don't know if I can. Is that slide? So those are things we don't have in, in, in classical measurement. So if I want to do the same uh, schematic representation I did for the classical pointer, we would have an initial state here of the system. Then this would be the pointer, initial state of the pointer. And after the interaction, we have this entangled state. And uh, at some point, we will measure this. I mean, I have assumed here that the quantum pointer is absolutely, that the pointer is absolutely quantum. And at some point, uh, we, we, we will need to assume that the pointer is measured in order to get a macroscopic uh, uh, rendering, which will give you a unique result. So this is something uh, that is not treated. We don't exactly know how to treat. Uh, we can always assume that the pointer is measured by another quantum pointer and so on. And it leads you nowhere. Uh, and so the, 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 there's nothing you can really do except there is, I assume there's some reduction at some point. And then, and so that's the projection. So, so one way to understand this is that you have an entangled quantum state, and when you try to measure uh, the pointer, then at this point you have the, the collapse or the reduction. This, of course, is something we don't have at all classically. Right, so I talked about ideal measurements in which uh, the pointer allows you to correlate perfectly the value of a property you're measuring. Now, in principle, I mean, that's uh, before you calibrate even a measurement uh, apparatus, you have a non-ideal measurement. So for a classical uh, point of view, if this is an ideal measurement, so this would be like uh, your two statistical classical distribution after the measurement, they would lead you to a different uh, region. Whereas an unideal measurement would have, for example, extremely wide statistical distributions that will not allow you to correlate in some, for example, in the overlapping region, you would not be able to, uh, to, to, to determine the value of the dichotomic variable. If it's here, you don't know if it's plus one or minus one. So it was plus one or minus one, but you don't know. You just don't know because your uh, measurement apparatus is not calibrated perfectly, it's not working perfectly, and so you have very wide uh, distributions for the, the pointer positions, and so that does not, does not, you, does not allow you to um, infer from, from the result the value of the property you are measuring. So basically, the problem is a problem of knowledge. I mean, you don't have uh, the statistical distributions do not give you the knowledge you need in order to determine the um, value of your dichotomic variable in an ideal classical measure. In a classical measurement, um, so things are, are, are different because if we go back to Van Neumann's model, well, if the pointer states are not orthogonal, you don't have uh, a correlation between the state of your system, the eigenstate of your system, and the pointer state. And if you don't have this correlation, you don't have an eigensense, and it means you don't have an eigenvalue. So you don't have any measurement outcome, right? With the classical, uh, classical statistical distributions, you have a classical outcome. You just don't know what it is. The quantum, I mean, if we take uh, von Neumann's model, clearly we, we don't have any definite outcome if we do a non-ideal measurement for uh, the problem that you're measuring. So, uh, so if I summarize this chapter on measurement, so with classical measurements, we have a pre-existent property. The properties have pre-existent values, but we have disturbance when we make a classical measurement. With quantum measurements, um, well, the properties arise from the measurement process itself. 
We have entanglement correlations, and then of course the strengthened projection. But uh, the properties do not have a definite value before making the measurement. So even after you make the measurement, if the measurement is not ideal, you still don't have a definite value. So actually, I, okay, there are two, two issues. One is the entanglement, which uh, does not allow you to have a definite outcome until you have this classical intervention. And the other thing is non-ideal uh, pointers in which uh, you don't correlate eigenvectors with pointer states, so you don't have eigenvalues in there. Are there ideal pointers? Yes, so. Ideal pointers. Okay, so then. Uh, How much time do I have left? Ten minutes. Okay, so I'll, maybe I'll have time to talk about the ABL rule. Um, so the ABL, the ABL rule is uh, a rule that comes out from uh, and quantum mechanics, there's nothing special in here. So basically, you have a sequence of observations. You have three observables, O1, O2, and O3, and they're measured at times T1, T2, and T3. So at T1, you have preparation. That's what we call pre-selection, and basically this term pre-selection uh, appeared in this Paper, so ABL stands for Aronoff, Bergman, and Lubovitz. In the 1964 paper, the term uh, pre-selection, pre-selection appears. So at T2, you have some intermediate projective measurement. And at T3, you have a final uh, post-selection. Final measurement and some post-selected state. So you go from O1, which is set, to O3, which you will filter, so which is some set. And O2, you have several possible outcomes, uh, which are here labeled by the letter J. So this, you know, the probability to obtain J O2J, so the J uh, outcome when starting from O1 gets given by Dunn rule. If you make the consecutive measurements, so from O1 to O2J, and then this gives you the probability, and then once you obtain O2J, so this is your first, so you start from O1, you make the first uh, projective measurement, you obtain O2J, and then you make another uh, projective measurement, and you only filter those for which you get O3. Maybe some O3 has, uh, has other possible, O2, sorry, other, I mean, you can have any outcome when you measure O3, but you measure the one that I just told you O3, so the probabilities are given here. And so the ABL rule 
tells you what is the probability to find O2j, so the jth eigenvalue for observable 2, if uh, I started from O1 and I condition my last measurement to yield O2. Just apply Bayes rule here. So we use this. And so basically, I mean, it's pretty intuitive. It's the probability to the probability to obtain the two J, the, the probability to make this uh, intermediate measurement having J the J having J value at the intermediate measurement divided by all of the measurements, all the results you can get. I'm sorry, I'm jet lagged, so I'm <laughs> like this. Um, so it's the probability to obtain the J outcome divided, so I do have this K maybe here, divided by the probability to obtain the sum of probabilities to obtain any of the possible outcomes of the intermediate measurement. Maybe it's better if I start from O1, obtain O3. So these are the different O2Js that you can obtain. One, when you make a projective measurement of O2. Right? So if we apply this to another type of three box problem, so again we have A, B, and C. So I choose this as the pre-selected state, O1 that is given here, and O3 as the post-selected state. So there's an, again, there's an observable that has different uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and I only select the ones that will give me the two people I want. So if I choose O1 and O3 as indicated, and I make an intermediate measurement, The question I'm asking here is, let's say, is the particle in box, can the particle be found in box A? The intermediate, so can the particle be found in box A with the condi condition on the fact that I have this initial state and this final state? So the particle cannot find in box, cannot be found in box A because of course I don't have an A at the, in, in, the, in the final state that I will measure. So if I found a, a particle in box A from the initial state, which is possible, I make a projective measurement, it will not find uh, the, the, the final state O3. I may find another eigenvector of this uh, observable. But not this one, because this one has no A component. So this is for just making projective measurements. There's no mystery here. Um, can I find it? Can I find it in box C, the intermediate measurement? No, for the same reason. Because uh, if I start from O1, there is no way I can I can reach C because uh, one is, is, is only a superposition of A and B, so there's no C. I cannot I can give you zero. So uh, the intermediate uh, measurement can only give me a result in box B. Now, you can introduce an observable, you can choose an observable O2 that has the following eigenstates. Um, so I've written them here. And if, we, and if I measure this uh, observable O2 in the, at the intermediate time, even though there's an eigenvector corresponding to box B, the probability of having um, the particle, finding the particle in box at intermediate time is not one anymore. So you can make, compute the thing, it should give you one quick equilibrium in one step. So this is just, uh, again, just standard projective measurements. There's nothing, nothing mysterious. 
So the, the conclusion is that if we open the boxes here individually, one by one, the only possibility is to find the particle in box B. But if I choose another observable that does not distinguish the three boxes individually, so it distinguishes B from a superposition of A and C, then in that case, I can't find the particles in box C, A and C. So this is pretty well uh, understandable in terms of contextuality. Because the, I think the question about whether the particles in box B and C intermediate measurements depends on the observable you're measuring, so on all the eigenvectors in some sense, not only on the specific uh, eigenstates here, which projection which projection you make in box C. So that's uh, <clears throat> maybe a little bit surprising, but actually it's pretty well uh, understood in the field of contextuality. Let me not talk about counterfactual now. Okay. Okay, so I think I will stop here. It's lunchtime, and then thank you this afternoon. Is there time for questions now? No. Go to lunch. Okay, I have to go to lunch.